G'day everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Australian Property Investment Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Christie David. I'm a mortgage broker and I run a business called Atelier Wealth. We specialize in helping property investors start out and scale up their property portfolios. For the ambitious property investor, one of the biggest hurdles that they face is not actually buying a property, but it's getting their loan approved. And that's why generally most investors are seeking out what they call an investment savvy mortgage broker, who you go to their suite of lenders and says, right, here's the policy or here's the lender that we're gonna pick for you based on what your requirements are. So knowing that it's often referred to as a game of finance, knowing which bank to go to and how they assess your loan application is the exact topic that we're gonna to discuss today. And I'm pumped to be here at the offices of Bluestone. So if you don't know them, they're one of the Australia's top non-bank lenders. And I've been privileged to get access to one of the senior underwriters, Jamie Beleza. G'day, how you doing? Yeah, well, thank you. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for being here. No, thank you for having me. I appreciate this is not your day job. Uh, and thanks for putting your hand up. You've uh, <laughs> kindly volunteered to, uh, to go through a Q&A. And the Q&A really is for a lot of our clients and a lot of people that are going through the loan application process to actually understand what goes on behind the scenes. So that's what I'm dubbing this. I'm calling behind the scenes on someone's loan application. And I want to go through and understand why does the bank, I wouldn't say move the goalpost, but why do they ask for more information? That, that tends to be one of the one of the big, I guess, uh, friction points that a client has when they're trying to get their loan approved. But uh, to go back a step, when mm -hmm. I introduce you as a senior underwriter, uh, another name for your role, or similar role, is a credit manager or a credit assessor. Mm -hmm. uh, so in layman's terms, what does that actually mean to be a credit manager, credit assessor, or senior or, uh, underwriter? Yeah. So basically a credit assessor or a credit underwriter is the person who will review your credit application. Uh, so when your credit application comes in, what we're really looking at is, um, you know, what the purpose of your loan application is and whether or not our product is suitable to meet your loan purpose um, and whether or not we can meet your loan requirements and objectives as well. Yeah. So being a senior underwriter at Connective Elevate and Bluestone, we have a specific underwriting team who will We'll look at um, reviewing the applications uh, submitted by accredited brokers and what we really want to look at is again just the purpose of the application uh, and whether or not we can find um, a solution for the customer. Yeah okay so that <clears throat> so I guess the big message that we're getting there is once the loan has been submitted by a broker there's a human on the other side that's looking through the application in detail going yes that meets policy or yes that's you know, an acceptable property for example yeah I can see the notes um, which then almost opens the, the door to the next question and I think when you and I had a chat before I've worked out with your user experience I'm giving away yeah <laughs> any years here but uh, the number of applications that you've worked on in your career would probably top over 20,000 so you've seen the good the bad the ugly and almost the great so there's uh, there's a term that I call loan submission quality. And it's not, I've created that, it's, it's commonly known, there's different words around it, right? Uh, but what it's saying is there's good applications, there's really solid applications, and then there's sometimes poor or you know, gray areas when it comes to applications as well. So when your trained eye is looking through an application, what specifically are you looking for, Jane? Yeah, uh, look, I think in terms of, you know, credit applications, every applicant, um, is different and every application is different. Yeah. Everyone's got different circumstances. Uh, so in terms of an assessment, really there are four primary aspects uh, that really build a credit assessment, yeah. um, which is purpose, uh, conduct, capacity, and collateral. Yeah. So really in terms of uh, loan purpose, when an application comes in as an assessor, I'm asking myself, you know, what's the objective of this application. Is it a refinance? Is it a purchase? Are the customers seeking cash out? Um, yeah. What exactly do they want to achieve uh, by taking out this finance application? Yeah. Um, and how can I work with policy to find a solution for the customer? Yeah. Um, in terms of capacity, what yeah. we're really looking for or what we're asking for is to determine whether or not a customer services our application. Yeah. So based on their income, um, their current liabilities, their current expenses, what we're really looking at is a positive servicing position. Yeah. Um, so it's again, going back to, because this, yeah. you and I, when we, I don't say jargon, but this is our world, right? But uh, when a broker puts an application to a bank, we do what's called a servicing calculator. So yes. putting the numbers through the calculator, putting incomes, putting expenses, putting the loan, at that stage, you, get, you pretty much get a green or red with a loan. Yeah 
ticks it, you know, is it, is it can serve us or not. But then yeah, you mentioned that you're, you're looking through that. So again, what are you looking for in the servicing count, Jen? Uh, so really, we want to make sure that firstly, the information that we have uh, for the client is accurate yeah. and it's correct, um, and whether or not we can also verify that information. Yeah. So in terms of income, you know, are they self-employed? Do they have a uh, full-time or part-time job? Yeah. Um, and we're really looking at confirming the information that they've disclosed to us yeah. to make sure that the information is accurate, um, but also to really get an understanding of the customer's situation. Um, and if we don't have an understanding of it, that's kind of where additional inquiries come in or a request for additional documents may come in. Yeah. Um, but really it's trying to determine, okay, um, going back to you know the first aspect that I mentioned, loan purpose, yeah. uh, is this product beneficial to the customer or is this going to meet their loan purpose? Um, and if not, are there workarounds in terms of servicing yeah. that I need to look at before we can find a solution for the customer. And it's fair to say, sorry, jump in there, but it's fair to say sometimes we have a different perception of servicing. You have a different perception of servicing, right? Because um, I'll give an example. Some of the salary sacrifice, every bank try, try, keeps that um, and apportions that differently as well. So you, you have discrepancies that you can talk to the broker about. Right. Yeah, uh, I definitely <laughs> think that, you know, um, in terms of our internal processes, uh, our assessors will always look to discuss um, the servicing position of a client before yeah. providing a final decision on yeah. an application. Uh, we'll try our best to accommodate for what the client needs or what the client has asked for before we can go back and say, you know, this isn't working or mm. we can't find a solution for a customer. So right. it's all really about working with the broker as well, trying to workshop, you know, why there are discrepancies or yeah. why we have differences in our figures, yeah. but also providing, um, I guess, an understanding or an education piece as to, you know, this is how the income was calculated, yeah. Um, this is why we've received differences in our figures. Yeah. Um, and then going forward, you know, how can we avoid this in the future? Or yeah. what can we learn from um, this type of application in terms yeah. of the calculations that we currently have? Beautiful. Excellent. And again, touching on what you just said there was the application comes to us to make a decision. And the worst case decision, and I'm sure you don't have fun with it as well, is when a loan gets declined. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so take me through that. And I'm not sure you've got exact numbers on how many loans get declined, but let's go through what are the reasons that, we'll start with what are the reasons that a loan does get declined from your experience? Uh, there may be a couple of reasons as to why loans declined. Um, you know, for example, policy, the customer doesn't meet uh, a specific employment policy, as an okay. example, uh, or the security that they're proposing yeah. we take isn't acceptable. Okay. Um, or um, referring back to servicing, the customer just doesn't meet our serviceability requirements with the proposed finance that they're after mm. um, and their current income and their current liabilities. Yeah. Uh, so in terms of a decline, Again, we want to find a suitable solution for the customer, yeah. um, but credit assessing also means that we have to make sure, one, that there's a benefit to the customer taking out our product, and two, we need to be comfortable that if we are going to increase the customer's credit exposure, we're doing this in a responsible way where we're not going to put them in any future financial hardship or okay. we're not going to worsen their current uh, credit position. Yeah, right. <clears throat> so do you have any off-the-cuff numbers or percentages you think of what loans actually do, de do get declined? Uh, <clears throat> I don't have any specific numbers. I think, yeah. again, you know, we try our best to accommodate for what the client has asked for. So we will try and uh, workshop yeah. um, applications with our brokers. Yep. Um, this may be, you know, for example, if the customer is seeking a refinance of their mortgage, are there any additional liabilities that they would want us to refinance to yeah. help boost that servicing position Beautiful. to a point where we'd be comfortable to, um, you know, address the servicing concern that was originally held on the application? Yeah. Um, or we'll look to workshop an application with a broker where a customer may have additional information that we can look at um, yeah. and that we can consider. Uh, I guess in terms of declines, they are tricky because, you know, people apply for finance with a specific purpose and Correct. we do want to cater um, to 
to a customer's request, but at the yeah. same time, you know, we have to do what's right for the customer. We have to do what's right for the business yeah. and make sure that we're writing responsible loans. Yeah. Um, and, you know, sometimes that just means a customer might have to wait three to six months before they're eligible for the product that they've asked for. Yeah, okay. Because hearing that, because you go, okay, as a broker, you submit a loan to a bank and the client's then thinking, hang on, well, shouldn't the broker have some type of onus or responsibility here going, well, you should have known that, for example. So there's sometimes, and I'm saying that's definitely true to a, to a certain extent, and there's sometimes things that blindside a broker as well. So it's some of those things that maybe pop up out of left field that you go, we didn't see that one coming, for example. Yeah. I think the big disconnect as to why that would happen is that the customer may not be truthful with the information that they're providing to their broker. Right, okay. Um, it definitely helps if, you know, uh, brokers are doing their part to make sure that the documents that they've provided are accurate, yeah. um, the information aligns to the documents submitted, um, and also that brokers have a real understanding of the circumstances that their clients are currently in. So, yeah, for okay. example, if they are seeking a refinance, um, you know, what are they looking to consolidate? What are they looking to refinance? Um, what's the servicing position on the loan before and after? Yeah. You know, are we putting them in a better position? Um, so those aspects of an assessment really do play a part in, I guess, the disconnect that we just touched on, yeah. where sometimes brokers may be blindsided with a decline because it was servicing at submission and it's yeah. no longer servicing at an assessment. Um, but that can always come down to, you know, unforeseen circumstances where a customer's change from being full-time to then being casual and they hadn't disclosed that change. Right. Um, or most often we get uh, undisclosed liabilities where okay. a customer may have, you know, forgotten that they've got a credit card and that sure. just tips them over the edge of yeah. servicing and not being able to service. Perfect. So again, in, in that example where hey, look, the credit cards come up, maybe the, and, and quite often the client doesn't even know they've got it, right? It comes up in the credit file and they, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. I don't even use it. So that stage, like, it's a decline, but can that be overturned if I say, kill that credit card off or, or cancel or pay out a car lease or a hex debt, for example, as well? Can, can a decline then be overturned? So I wouldn't personally decline an application if, say, for example, I cited one $2,000 undisclosed credit card. I think, you know, there should always be a uh, buffer as to what you can accept and what you can't accept for an undisclosed mm. liability. Again, you know, sometimes customers may be so overwhelmed in terms of what they currently have financially that they forget that they've got, you know, a $2,000 yeah. store card that they don't know is actually a credit card. Yeah. Um, or for example, you know, a buy now, pay later facility. Yeah. People don't understand that those are revolving we'll lines of credits that are technically classified as credit cards. Uh, so in terms of overturning a decline decision, we're always happy to consider additional information um, and revise a decline nice. if we do think that it's warranted. Yeah. Um, but again, we'll always try to do whatever we can first. That way we avoid you know, having to issue a decline and then have to reinstate the file because we're going back on the decision. Yeah. I think it's just a better customer experience Spot to, on. you know, have a first touch decision and yeah. whether or not that is an approval or a decline, I think, you know, confidence in your credit decision always plays a big part in mm. being able to deliver that to a customer or a broker as well. Ah, well said. Well said. Uh, going back to, the, you mentioned the client experience, that's one thing that we're super big on, right? Trying to make sure, again, we're moving things through as smoothly as possible for the for the client's experience, for our business as well, but also for in your situation where files are moving through you know, fairly seamlessly. Um, so the goal that's gonna be one touch, you want to call one touch approval, is very, very rare, but it does happen. But there are situations where the loan gets submitted to, at, at, and you're looking at it and you're gonna ask for more information. Now, you and I both know we, we hate picking up the phone and telling the client, hey, look, we need more information. The first question is why, and the second one, I've provided all this information before. And you can understand, I mean, we ask for a lot of information. Uh, that, you know, there'll be things that go out of date, say a pace that goes out of date by the time maybe it's reached yourself as a credit assessor. But then there are things like we need uh, extra bank statements or we're gonna need more information about an employment contract, for example. So when you're asking for more information, I guess there's two parts to it. Is it credit critical or is it, 
I won't say ticking boxes, but is it going through the process to say, yeah, I need this for my own due diligence. So take me through why you're asking for more information and then how that translates uh, to a customer as well, Jamie. Yeah. Look, I think in terms of from a credit perspective, um, any additional questions or inquiries that we have is always uh, really on a need to know basis. Okay. So it's always critical to our assessment in terms of trying to understand the customer circumstances. I think it's difficult to obviously place a customer in a specific box yeah. um, based on a specific policy. And we do try our best to accommodate to you know, the trickier or more complex applications that may sit in a gray area that's not black and white. Okay. Um, but understanding the customer's situation means that we do have to ask additional questions just so, again, we can get the decision right first time around um, and at least we can go back to the client with, I guess, possible solutions or recommendations for the future as well. Okay. Um, so in terms of additional questions and queries, um, we may ask for more information. Usually that is just because, you know, every application is different. Yeah. Um, every applicant is different. Yeah. I guess now, you know, with the past two years, people have different circumstances. People were impacted differently because of COVID. Um, people have different life events and different unforeseen circumstances mm. that may lead to certain impairments on their credit file or certain um, conduct that may not fit a prime criteria, okay. let's say. So let's say, um, for example, they've missed the payment, for example, or yeah. late for a, you know, I don't know, a credit card or another loan repayment, for example. So what you're saying is, can, can you give us more information to help us move forward as opposed to can you give us more information for us to then say no? Yeah, yeah? exactly. I think it's important to remember as well that credit can't make assumptions about a customer's situation. Yeah, okay. We want to understand as best we can what's gone in the customer's lives because, again, every application has its mm. own set of circumstances um, and we're never going to get an application that, you know, is reflected in another one. Yeah. So we want to try our best to accommodate to customers as much as we can with the policy that we have. Yeah. Um, but that also means sometimes asking for additional documents to yeah. help support our credit decision. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's right. And I, mean, I was saying before, before we uh, sat down, like, this is just one of those, not the fun part where you go, look, applications, you want the bank, they want more information. Generally, the knee-jerk reaction is oh, more information. And I guess once they get over that little bit of anger or frustration, it's okay, what do they need and why do they need it? And that's where I guess the, your broker's role becomes important, which is, okay, they need this information to give a bit of context. Why? I think that's probably one of those big disconnects that happens sometimes between an assessor with a broker and then to a customer is, but why is this information needed? And to give that, that level of context as well. So thank you very much. There was something you mentioned earlier as well, so I'm not going to hold you to this, but yeah. I want to say, um, as a senior underwriter, I may feel comfortable you know, with a, a credit card uh, that's not being disclosed. And it's fair to say, just like not all brokers are created equally, not all credit assessors are created equally as well, right? Uh, so what, I guess, it's experience, it's, it's knowledge, it's years, you know, years of looking at it as well. Um, take me through senior underwriter versus a normal underwriter, for example, are they less experienced? Uh, do, they, do, do the junior underwriters then get signed off by a senior underwriter? How does that internal um, situation work as well, Jamie? Yeah, so in terms of the credit assessors that we do have, um, we do have underwriters and then senior underwriters um, and also lending managers. Okay. We all each have uh, a specific delegation that we okay. can write to. So, so a delegation for, for the uninitiated is? Uh, so a delegation is basically an amount that you can sign off on. Okay. So for example, as a senior underwriter, I can sign off on a larger loan amount okay. in comparison to an underwriter. Yeah, okay. I guess in terms of expertise it may come down to you know how long you've been in the industry mm. working in lending if you've had previous experience elsewhere um, but also it it does come down to I guess your own internal uh, risk appetite yeah I, I do believe that that does play a part in um, you know whether or not you would be more inclined to query something whereas another underwriter may not 
be yeah. querying um, that particular aspect of an application. It really just depends. Yeah. Um, and this really is that subjectivity to it, right? Because you can put, and this is what I say to a client, you could put the same application into a bank, not, not picking up Bluestone, for example, any lender. You can have two credit managers at the same bank and get two very different interpretations or even outcomes sometimes as well, right? Based on their own experience, their own knowledge and their own, you know, their own, what they're reading in the file notes as well, right? Yeah, for sure. I, I definitely agree. I think there are pros and cons to having different perspectives mm. on, um, you know, credit risk and your what your credit, credit appetite is. Yeah. I think overall, though, it's a strength um, for our connective Elevate and Bluestone team because yeah. we're very much a very open and transparent team where we regularly uh, question our own decision making yeah, nice. just to ensure that we're making the best possible decision for our ap applicants. Yeah. So, you know, if I think that something is a decline, um, I'll definitely always reach out to not even just the seniors, but also um the underwriters in the team because they can definitely give me a perspective that I may not have previously oh, looked at yeah. um, in the past. And I guess it goes to the same lending team. You know, everything is based on experience and nice. perception. And sometimes you think you've seen it all and then you get an application <laughs> and it's completely yeah, exactly. different. It's our world. Um, yep. So having a team that is as experienced as the one that we have, uh, you know, um, I'm learning new things from the team every day in terms mm. of my own um, credit appetite and how I underwrite, just yeah. based on you know the way that everyone else does. But we try to keep our decisions, um, or I guess our uh, risk appetite, as uniform as possible. That yeah. is hard because everyone works in different ways. But you know that's why we do have policy and certain parameters that we mm. can work to to ensure that we're trying to give. Um, as best of a uniform service to our brokers and our customers Lovely. as much as we can. Ah, oh, fantastic. And then again, going back to what I mentioned before about loan submission quality. So what, if, you know, two parts of it from a broker perspective, but also from a customer perspective, how does an application kind of get upweighted or recognizes this is a really good and well put together application, do you think? Yeah, so I think in general, uh, lenders will have a minimum um, requirement list. Yeah, so your normal checklist to... about this is the minimum standards that we need on the application, for example. Yeah. Even then I've seen, you know, I've, I've read a stat, uh, stat that I think CBA is still the number one outstanding is up-to-date pay slips. We go, that's basic stuff, right? Yeah. So there's basic stuff, but then there's going, well, actually, beyond the minimum standards, putting things like shares or superannuation or cars, that, that can upweight your, your asset position as well. So what are the other things that you're seeing? Yeah, I think in, in terms of loan submission quality, I would classify, um, you know, high submission quality or like yep. a great submission to be one that has uh, the relevant supporting documents I need, the relevant yep. information that I need, um, and also submission notes. Submission notes go a long way in yeah, terms we'll of, see. you know, helping the assessor understand um, the customer circumstances and, you know, what's happened on this application yeah. and, you know, what do we need to look out for? And if you're anticipating that we're going to ask a question about a certain area, let me know in the comments so I don't have to ask you. Ah, fantastic. Um, I so think, yeah. Just sorry to jump in, but to, yeah, again, we always say, look, in, in, in layman's terms or for the uninitiated, what that means is when an application goes to a bank, the broker or a broker has the ability to put in commentary. So let's say, for example, the, the car loan's being paid out or the hex is being paid out or the clients are you know, living with family at the moment, which explains living expenses or if it's a certain age that they're at, you know, they've got enough superannuation to pay out the loan or they're going to downsize. So the, a lot of those gray areas or subjectivity should be and can be addressed in the loan notes. And we talk about this with our own clients, the commentary that goes into it, the clients may never see that, but we're putting that much detail that when it goes to a credit manager like yourself, they should be able to pick it up going, yes, I can understand that because we've had that conversation, that interaction with the client and then trying to translate that to you to make your decision easier or better, isn't it? Yeah, uh, definitely. I think um, in terms of submission comments, you know, it, it does go a long way in helping the assessor. I think, you know, um, I'm sure you'd appreciate uh, credit assessors looking at multiple applications every day. Spot on. Um, 
to an assessor, we don't know the client. Yeah. You know, we don't know the emotional side of why they may have missed a credit card payment or why they may have missed their mortgage payment that month. Yeah. We don't have that background and we don't have that understanding of the client. All we have are the documents and the information presented to us so yeah. we can make a decision on the file. Um, it, it goes a long way when it, you know, you have a background and you have a better understanding as to what's gone on in the client's lives. This is why they've applied for finance. This is what they want to get out of it. Yeah. Um, and these are specific areas of their application that we want to specifically address in the submission comments because yeah. we know you're going to ask a question and we have an explanation for it. Yeah, fantastic. So I, I guess in terms of submission quality, I definitely think as an underwriter, the better the submission quality at the start of the application, mm. the less likely you're going to hear from us in terms of additional questions and additional queries. We're most likely going to not ask for additional documents because we've already got that background and understanding of the client's circumstances. Yeah. Uh, and it's really just more likely for us to be able to give you that fast um, assessment and one touch decision where we can at least come back to you and say, you know what, this is what I need to get it over the line yeah. or I can get this to conditional today. This is what I need before formal approval. Beautiful. And that's, I mean, the goal is always to try and get to formal approval. You just touched on one of the big important words that I want to ask you about, which is conditional approval. So quite often <clears throat> it's like we're at conditional approval. We're asking for a bit more information. Can some be put to formal? Can some be put to as a settlement condition? What are the, what are the options at that stage as well? Uh, it look it always comes down to the discretion of the underwriter. Yeah. You know what they're comfortable with. Uh, I guess in terms of uh, reaching a conditional approval, I myself want to be comfortable with the fact that I can move this to conditional, and the additional information I'm going to ask pre formal approval is not going to impact or change my decision. Lovely. So uh, unconditional approval means that, you know, we can ask for certain documents or certain information and we're still happy for that to proceed to settlement or whatever yeah, okay. it may be. Um, there are certain aspects of an application where we're just not comfortable to move it to formal approval. So okay. for example, uh, credit card closures or anything to do with serviceability. Yeah, right. If, <clears throat> you know, it might be a tight servicing position that we're just not comfortable to push it over the line to formal approval. Yeah. We can still try our best to, you know, issue out a conditional. So at least your broker can go back to the client to say, you know, this is what we need, but we've got a conditional based on this. Yep. Uh, so we do try our best to have that one touch decision firsthand at initial assessment, but there are some things that we still have to be quite comfortable with before we're ready to move yeah. it to that formal approval stage. Yeah, nice. This is this is the goal. That's why I wanted to have a chat to you because we speak about this with our clients, but quite often it's like they don't want to hear that from us. They don't want to hear that from someone in your position, your authority going, I am the credit manager. I'm the one that's making that decision. Help me. And what I tell our clients is help me help you. Let me help you to get to that decision, which is either getting to that conditional and we know it needs to be met, mm -hmm. but it's pretty much, it's a formality at that stage to get to formal approvals, provide yeah. those, those documents versus we're going to provide those documents, going to come back and then ask for more documents. And that's, I guess, again, another friction point going, why don't you just ask for this all to begin with? But, um, but I, I like your approach, which is I want to feel comfortable to get a conditional. That information will then get us to the formal approval as well, which is unique, not exclusive, but not every bank operates in that vein as well, right? Each, each bank has their own processes, has their own procedures as well around what's a conditional, what's going to get to formal, and then what can be provided, you know, just before settlement as well. But Jamie, I want to say thank you very much. Um, thank you for your insights. Thank you for your time and your energy. Well, I really appreciate it. This is one of those episodes that I feel is going to have a long shelf life because as you know, more clients come in, this question just continues to sit around. Even people that have been there and done that before, who have had applications in the past still get a little bit nervous and tense around getting to formal approval and then once you get to that that pressure valve just comes right off but um, yeah the idea in the episode the idea behind this episode was actually speaking to someone like yourself going it can be it, it is a human looking at it and it can be an element of getting on the phone discussing an application go, okay yeah i feel comfortable with that gray area now now we can kind of move forward as well 
So yeah. thank you very much. Really appreciate it. No, thank you for having me. Excellent. That's a wrap for another episode of the Australian Property Investment Podcast. If you found that helpful, please reach out and, uh, and drop us a line. If you've got any other questions for future episodes, let us know as well. But I want to say a special thank you to, to Jamie and the team at Bluestone as well for being so generous with team and also a location as well. Until next time, take care.